It's tax week here at Coindesk. All week long, we've been covering the stories to help you make sense of your crypto taxes. How much you are taxed depends on where you are. The U.S. territory of Puerto Rico has become a crypto paradise thanks to generous tax breaks. Joining me now to discuss is Michael Turpin, Transform Group CEO and co-founder, as well as Gustavo Diaz-Scott, founder of BASED. Michael, Gustavo, thanks for joining us. Uh, let's start with Michael. So. Act 22, 22, this legislation was passed in 2012. It offers people who live on the island for at least half of the year tax-free profits on their investments, which are otherwise subject to federal taxes of up to 37%. Are there hurdles to being eligible for Act 22? Well, basically, um, uh, you can't go if you're a, a, a criminal, you have a felony, there's a few other things, but largely, uh, if you move down there fully and you're there more than six months of the year um they've added new requirements every year now you have to also uh buy a home and have that be your pr primary residence and you also have to uh have a uh nonprofit donations every year um for ten thousand dollars or more um and you have to fill out a lot of forms and there's another five thousand dollars a year that you have to pay as an administrative fee um but uh for the most part uh, those are the main requirements um, you know, it is, um, um, you know, it, there's a lot of people who move from New York to Nevada or to Miami. It's just a little bit uh, further to go an extra thousand miles uh, to the Caribbean. And, um, and you know, there are some, um, you know, lifestyle uh, things you have to get used to because it is a territory and not a state. But um, I've been down there seven years. This will be my eighth year coming up, and I love it down there. How much do you think... Uh folks in the crypto community are saving thanks to this uh, Act 22? Well, this year, probably not too much because yeah. the markets are down, but I'd it's say in overall, the bear market, um, maybe not. Yeah, but um, overall, um, you know, I mean, they save 100% uh, of their capital gains. So it depends on how much uh, capital gains they've had. Uh, obviously, um, since um, the 2020 elections has been I believe about two thirds of the, uh, the of the people who live there um, from the crypto community came down since uh, 2020. Um, so obviously uh, there was a thought that uh, in the Biden administration the tax would go up, and um, so it continues to be new people you know coming down every month. Gustavo, most native Puerto Ricans don't qualify for the capital gains exemption. Is there a push to change that aspect of the law? <laughs> Capital gains is just one of the pieces that needs to be amended, amended to reach full um, equity and participation. I think that when it comes to understanding the incentives, it's important to note that Act 60 covers more than 11 chapters. Everything from hospitality, Section 8 housing, green, uh, green energy, manufacturing, film and other tax incentives for creatives, insurance, you name it. Um, out of 166,000 businesses registered and active in Puerto Rico, there's around 7,821 that actually use or benefit from a decree. That's a utilization rate less than 6%. When we talk about the capital gains and some of the uh, conversations that are moving around these incentives for individuals, we need to highlight that incentives for individuals are for three types, individual investors, medics, and researchers and academics. We've had around 4,300 individual investors that moved to Puerto Rico and should be investing on the island and its projects. We are looking at 5,000 medics that have moved their practice, also equitable um, economic power as to the Act 22 individuals. This is this was a former Act 14. And then we have more than 100 researchers that are actively involved in academia and research and development studies of other areas. Now, when we look at for medics, they are providing a service that neither the federal or the state government can provide, and that is saving lives inside of hospitals. For founders and for investors, that we're hoping that that capital will be invested in Puerto Rico. I think part of the conversation around capital gains depends on how do we showcase and how do we present the impact of these investments and these risk capital that Puerto Rico has brought to get to the island. All right, Gustavo, you were also born and raised in Puerto Rico. So how has crypto changed the island over the years? Crypto has changed the island over the years since 2017 in ways that I would say are unforeseen. Um, Hurricane Maria, the earthquakes, the, so, the social, political turmoil, 
presented and gave us lessons in adversity that other areas around the world will start to, will start to grapple with today. I think that the good that blockchain has brought to the island is a new perspective of how do we build or how do we solve tomorrow's climate issues, parametric insurance issues, and other problems that with blockchain could be um, executed faster, more reliably, and with more trust into uh, the issues that are pressing the island. I think that crypto and blockchain, when it comes to Puerto Rico, separating them, it is very hard to cut the fat from the meat, but there are projects and there are folks, including like Michael, that are investing into the future generation of founders, such as Michelangelo, for example, with Tradery and other companies locally. Yeah, we were just showing images of Puerto Rico during uh, the latest hurricane. But uh, Michael, critics say that the influx of crypto business has created a rise in home prices. You mentioned that one of the requirements in Act 22 was to buy a home, make investments. So in some of the areas, uh, you're seeing rising home prices, and that hasn't uh, necessarily created more jobs. Tax relief seekers have also been criticized for really not integrating with the rest of the island. So how do you respond to those who say these tax laws, tax laws aren't benefiting local residents? Sure. So um, uh, Governor Perluisi uh, was actually in the administration that passed it. And I spoke with him uh, before he was elected. Um, he spoke to the Partnership of Modern Puerto Rico, which is a group that was put together by former Secretary of Economic Development, Alberto Baco, has become a good friend. Um, and he has a nonprofit group that basically um, brings together the Act um, 60 entrepreneurs with the families who've been on the island running family businesses for 100 years. And so that they understand each other's issues and they get to know each other. And it's been wildly successful. They, you know, they, they, they've invested in each other's companies. They understand, you know, what the island, you know, has had as, as, as its past. It's, uh, it's, it, it's present and, and, and what the people who have been born here and have been here generations look and want for the future. And they also understand now how to integrate some of the technologies, not just blockchain, but medical services and a lot of other things that have come, uh, you know, from the X. I mean, some of the largest Act 20 companies have come down have been in the, in the med tech area. Um, Michael, does, right does your company employ a, folks on the island? Yes, absolutely. We've invested okay. in companies on the island. We've got about 10 people we employ on the island. Um, let me get specifically back to real estate, which is why I brought up uh, Alberto Baco's group. Um, uh, Pierre Luisi, uh, Governor Pierre Luisi said one of the main reasons that they needed to go and institute um, Act 20 and Act 22 was the failing real estate uh, markets in uh, in Puerto Rico. Condado Beach, which now everybody's complaining is way too expensive, um, was literally being abandoned. I mean, the Vanderbilt Hotel was going to be torn down. Um, the um, uh, La Concha had been uh, boarded up. And, um, you know, if you give me an up, if you give me a choice in an economy of prices going up and prices going down and being abandoned, I will take prices going up anytime. This is not unique to San Juan. Um, Miami is having the exact same thing. There are neighborhoods like Wynwood where people who were born in Wynwood can't afford to buy a condo in Wynwood because the price have gone up. But guess what? The people who were, who were there last generation sold to the people and they weren't forced to sell. There's been nobody, um, you know, there's a lot of places where economic development comes in, they force people to sell. That's not happening in Puerto Rico. You know, my wife and I bought two homes in Puerto Rico, one in Miramar and one in Guanabo. In both cases, we bought them from Puerto Ricans. We paid full list price and um, they were very happy to sell to us. Nobody forced them to sell and right. uh, they went on to buy other homes. And well, so um, I think that I have a lot heard of that the media some Puerto Ricans, though, they can't afford renting. to live in the neighborhoods that they've been used to. And so, I mean, selling in selling, they've had to move but away to neighborhoods not, but that, that are but that, well, no, 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 more no, no, affordable. No, no. Typically what you've seen, if you read, if you read the, the media coverage, it's typically been people who rented. So people who rented in Miami can't afford in their neighborhoods as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, that would be problematic for folks in Puerto Rico who are native to the land and can't afford the rent. But nevertheless, and that's and that's uh, what well, I was going to say. And, and again, you don't have to live in Dorado Beach. You don't have to live in Condado Beach. There are plenty of places in Puerto Rico. And I, I guess I'll defer to, to Gustavo where they can afford, uh, you know, <laughs> very large places. I mean, I, I can point out a lot of places in Guanabara you can get that are not uh, at, uh, you know, Ashford. Gustavo, Ashford do you want to add to that? 
I'll, I'll add to that. I think that when it comes to uh, the purchase of real estate in Puerto Rico, it was designed as a way to attract and retain the capital that was brought to the island because of these policies. Now, when it comes to the actual purchase of real estate, there's a difference between individual investors, which is former Act 22, and the actual medics that also came back with a similar economic, social, uh, social economic background that also bought real estate. Uh, some of these medics also include Puerto Ricans. Now, there is a difference between the service that that individual with a benefit provides to the island, which is their knives and their brain on an operation table, and then there's the impact of investors on the island. I think that the, the biggest questions that people have on their mind, and this is a sentiment, is where is the capital going? Is it investing? Is it going to founders that are solving issues that are in, that are similar in Puerto Rico, also across the world, and are not just restricted to this 100 by 35. I think that part of this lack of clarity has continued to propel founders to seek uh, resources locally, specifically through 200 uh, entrepreneurial support organizations, all of them non-profits that continue powering the next generation of founder, next, the next generation of native uh, Puerto, Puerto Ricanos that continue to bet into the future and bet into what solutions can be built from here. I think that as we go into highlighting the work of Michael, for example, and other founders that have come here in the past decade, we'll be able to not only educate, but also present what is the reality and the impact and the benefit of having risk capital and human talent in Puerto Rico. Um, I can also add around the misconception that we're we just published a summary of Act 60 complete, completely on L60PR.com. And during Blockchain Week, we will be running a nine-hour uh, workshop marathon free of cost to help founders in Puerto Rico get their incentive, be it bona fide farmers, be it creatives, be it young entrepreneurs, be it people writing lines of code, that's manufacturing. All of it will be December 8th and December 9th at the Holberton School. All right. Michael and Gustavo, thank you so much for joining us. That was Michael Turpin, Transform Group CEO and co-founder, and Gustavo Diaz-Goff, founder of BASED. For more Tax Week stories, check out Coindesk.com.